Right. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the second day of the Manila PTG. Uh, today we have uh, a lot of topics to cover. Um, I think like it's it's the beginning of uh, the week for us to the topics to, to cover. In the past session, we had the Manila retrospective. So if you didn't uh, have the time uh, to check that, the recording is av already available on YouTube in the OpenStack Manila channel. So please check that out if you want to. Uh, yeah, so today we will start our uh, discussions with uh, the theme provisioning and oversubscription improvements. And uh, we have here in this call today, uh, Hyxin and Gotham to talk about uh, those changes with us. So yeah, Gotham, Hyxin, floor is yours. Uh, there's a reader pad for this topic here. Uh, I'm already sharing the screen, but if you want to follow the discussion, I can share both links to the either pads. This one is for the Zorilla PTG. And the other one is for the disc uh, is the discussion topic this discussion either pet so yeah the floor is yours awesome uh, thanks Carlos uh, am I audible yes great okay all right uh, I think Hayek seems here as well yeah I hi, see hi. him connected. Hey, Hyaxine. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, the first topic is about uh, the, the uh, <clears throat> a lot of kids uh, uh, kept, uh, kept stated, uh DB uh, in uh, 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 today I uh, uh, today I look at the code again, uh, and uh, uh, in this part, uh, we can we can look at this link. I uh, I write some uh, uh, I write all the idea uh, on the pipe uh, uh, about that bug. Uh, I think uh, uh, this patch. Uh, 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 can we? <clears throat> I don't know how to say. I got you. I think uh, so. Thanks for filling out this etherpad. Um, so I'm just adding a link to the uh, to the bug that started this whole discussion. Um, and so uh, I've since shared uh, his notes on the etherpad. Um, so we were collaborating on that. Um, so you, you, so we can possibly, you know, explain what's going on uh, and take questions and 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 kind of evolve a solution, right? So we're still thinking about what's the best way to fix this bug. Um, and it is not. It is a problem that's been around ever since um, thin provisioning and oversubscription was allowed with Manila. Uh, so if uh, let's probably start from that. Uh, what do you think, Hayekseen? What is the uh, issue itself? Um, and we uh, thanks for sh sharing the bug uh, over there. So the problem was that um, when we were running some Tempest tests, uh, we ran into a situation where the scheduler was running into a bad thread switch uh, with uh, and it and it kind of errored out by um, while calculating the provisioning ratio. And the provisioning ratio over here uh, is, is incorrect. That's kind of where we started. And Hyaxine had this patch where he was trying to fix that. Um, so going back, what is, uh, what, what is the base issue over here? Well, if you, are, if you have a storage backend that has some pools that support thin provisioning, um, and by thin provisioning is uh, sparse placement of uh, of your shares right so a user wants a 10 gigabyte share but you really don't set aside 10 gigabytes on the storage system you 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 create uh, a container with whatever uh, minimal size and the storage system takes care of making sure that uh, you know uh, <clears throat> there is space that is claimed as 10 gigabytes but it's it's really not reserving as much space that's kind of what's going on 
um and and that allows for a storage pool to be oversubscribed so if all of the users in the cloud want their 10 gigabyte shares on the storage system they they can still be accommodated even if the storage pool is not really that big um so the the assumption here is that not everybody is going to end up using all of that storage so you you tend to pr uh, preserve um this pool from uh, being wasted uh, in terms of allocation itself so it's a it's a pretty um, um you know useful thing as far as uh, you know provisioning in the cloud goes so how does how is this done well there are two two uh, huge the two heuristics here one is called the allocated capacity gb and the other is provision capacity gb and we do some math with these capacity numbers that we are deriving from the storage backend um, and the math that we are doing is to to come up with what is uh, i mean what exactly is the backend subscribed like right so how much of it is really used and if and if this real usage can be uh, then you know extended to try and project okay well, how much might be used if i if i add one more uh, share into this storage system that's kind of what the math is and you'll see see us uh, describe the math down in this etherpad um, but let's peel back what is allocated capacity gb and what is provision capacity gb that was kind of where this bug first began um, so they, these are loosely understood. We don't have good documentation of it. Um, and I was, for instance, stunned when, uh, when we were fixing it this way. Um, allocated capacity GB is whatever Manila allocates on the storage system, on that specific storage pool. Um, and for many backends, they just support one giant pool of storage. So you can think of it as, uh, you know, your storage pool that we're talking about is the storage backend that's configured. But for backends such as uh, Dell EMC or NetApp uh, storage systems, they have they they can potentially support multiple pools. And so we're talking about a single pool on that storage system, uh, and how much of it has been, you know, consumed by Manila shares, um, and Actually, consumed is probably the wrong word here. How much of it has been allocated to Manila shares? Um, consumed being how much of it is being currently used. And the other number here is provision capacity GB. And this comes from the assumption that Manila is not the only provisioner um, that's consuming space, that's allocating space on top of the storage pool. Uh, so it's possible that there is somebody else that's also provisioning uh, <coughs> volumes uh, or shares on the same st storage pool. So we we don't want to assume that, uh, you know, Marilla is the only source of truth or source of uh, provisioning here. So it could be an administrator that's doing some manual uh, interactions and, uh, you know, creating some space. It could be unmanaged volumes, uh, unmanaged shares. It could even be, uh, you know, another Manila or another kind of provisioner like Manila that is, uh, you know, orchestrating storage on the same storage pool. So we want to know both of these numbers. What is the thing that we have allocated and what is the thing that uh, <clears throat> that exists on the storage system itself that, that, that has been allocated on the storage system totally. Do we care about both of these numbers? We actually care about the latter when we're doing the provisioning ratio uh, so that we want to be right. Uh, we don't want to just take the promises that we have made, but also whatever uh, uh, other provisioners are doing. But the, uh, I mean, storage systems are not all built the same. So uh, there's there's actually been quite a lot of uh, systems that could not tell us exactly what is allocated by Manila and what is allocated by somebody else. Um, so they're they're not able to uh, you know delineate these numbers and tell, and let us know. So that's kind of where this um, issue began. So the, the proposal that Hyaxine has is to um, calculate the allocated capacity GB and uh, represent that uh, as the provision capacity GB in case the backend is not giving us what the total uh, provision capacity GB is. Um, and and why does Manila have to calculate the allocated capacity GB? Well, because Manila knows what is allocated on that storage pool, and we really don't need this information coming from the backend. Um, if it's all right, if backend has some way to dis, uh, you know discern that, all right, Manila has set aside you know 
uh, x amount of uh, gigabytes in, in terms of storage but if the backend is not uh, willing to tell us that information or able to tell us that information we should be able to calculate this and this calculation has been a point of contention uh, we have uh, had a number of bugs where this calculation is is kind of uh, wonky uh, including the one that you see up the, on the on the uh, etherpad um, so let's probably scroll a little bit uh, so what does it mean i think um, what, what what are we trying to improve well the uh, the calculation is is one of it which is we're doing it in the wrong place and we're doing it way too often um, in the sense we are performing this calculation in the scheduler if there is a backend that does not provide us the value for um, you know allocated capacity gb we are ending up uh, recalculating all of the allocated space on that backend every single time uh, the the backend is reporting to the scheduler and you can uh, you can assume that if a backend has four pools uh, and and it is scheduled to report every 60 seconds uh, so we're we're actually doing a calculation four times every every minute uh, on the scheduler so it's quite it's kind of a heavy thing that's going on um and we 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 if we could avoid that uh, or probably make it better and part of the other thing that's happening here is if you've de uh, if you've deployed the manila scheduler service uh, multiple times in your cloud so you could have um, you know multiple um, versions of this uh, sorry multiple copies of the scheduler service running on different nodes each of these nodes is performing this calculation and it does need the the total number but it 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 really does not need uh, need to be that each scheduler is also doing this calculation right so there could be some way we could we perform this calculation and share it with the schedulers rather than um, uh, each of them being tasked to redo this calculation that's that's the gist of it um, of that particular problem um, so the, the 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 proposed um, solution for this is to try and um, perform this calculation in the share manager service and do this once when the when the when the backend is instantiated and from there on make use of the uh, of the of the database and and try to optimize this calculation so each time the, when the service is running we really don't need to um, you know pull up all of the uh, shares from the uh, from the database and 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 redo these calculations right so we could we could store that number somewhere that we that we can then reuse every time a share is created or deleted we could we could you know adjust that number we could uh, increase it if the share if a new share is created decrease it if a share has been deleted and so on um, so that's the uh, the first recommendation that's there uh, and what would this do well if we tell the share manager to do this uh, the share manager then reports the allocated capacity to gb directly to the scheduler so all of the schedulers in the uh, in in the system are going to get it uh, so we don't repeat ourselves in the scheduler service and you can i mean the next obvious question is well what if this share manager is running in active active um, fashion well that's that's the other part of this that when we are doing uh, 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 this calculation we would make sure that we are putting this number in the database such that if there is a context of this in the database then the the, the uh, you know the the active active clones of the share manager don't need to uh, to perform this calculation they can just read it from the database and report it uh, to the scheduler so that's the uh, th that's the um, the proposal for how how this calculation can be done how does this database look well this is stuff that we're still um, you know brainstorming uh, we don't really have any sort of a working work table um, for uh, where this data can can actually be stored right away, uh, so uh, it, you can expect that we probably create some space um, that we that we want to put this in, uh, number into, um, and and we don't know the schema of that. It is something that uh, you know I intend to talk uh, work with Hyaxine, uh and evolve 
and what else? Yeah, uh, hi, Xin. Is there anything more to add about that problem? Uh, you speak too fast. I can't. Uh... <laughs> Sorry. No, yeah. I was just reading out whatever we yeah. had on the Etherpad, um, but probably, you know, uh, summarizing it rather than this thing. So all of this info is on this Etherpad if you're, if you're looking to read it. Mm. Uh, the first point is <clears throat> uh, we can uh, see the top of the pad. I have added uh, one line. Uh, uh, I think uh, the uh, we we get uh, provision the capacity GB for backend is uh, correct, mm, but the a lot of kit uh, capacity GB for backend uh, may be not correct uh, uh, unless uh, uh, it's uh, close to uh, the storage pro. Uh, so I think uh, 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 the provisional capacity GB is more useful for for. Uh, for us, so uh, in my uh, uh, in my patch, I uh, I I will uh, try to uh, uh, try to get a provision of capacity GB. Uh, if not uh, reported by backend, we we uh, uh, we we sit. Uh, a lot of kit uh, capacity GB as a provision uh, uh, capacity GB. We assume uh, uh, the, the Manila uh, uh, is close to the backend core. Mm, uh, uh, in my uh, in my page, uh, it's uh, the uh, one <clears throat> one more thing to restore is about. Uh, 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 the, uh, 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 the, uh, the Manila scheduler, uh, 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 the, uh, uh, HA, uh, just like, uh, uh I, I said in the, in the, in the, in the land, uh, 91, the, the situation. Nine ninety one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, in this situation, uh, different uh, uh, a different scheduler node, uh, will get uh, uh, uh will get a different uh, uh capacity GB, uh about uh, the same backend. So in my patch, I, uh, I, I calculate uh, uh, the capacity GB from database to make uh, this value <coughs> uh, right. Yeah, I see. Uh, thank you for uh, bringing this discussion up. Um, I would like to ask you if you uh, thought about uh, adding like uh, a specification for this. Uh, if you if there is like any plan for that, or uh, you think like we wouldn't need to do that. Uh, the share manager sir will perform an uh, uh, estimator. Uh, I think uh, uh, this uh, this will uh, this could be unrestored. Unre uh, we can use uh, share measure to calculate the associated uh, uh, allocated GB and write it to the database, then scheduler to read from. Uh, a read from a DB. Uh, in order to 
uh, 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 avoid the uh, uh, dialog db. We can make uh, some uh, 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 wait a minute, I translate it. Um, Yeah, I like I like this plan. Uh, like having this in the database and this being performed in the Azure Manager uh, looks good. Uh, sounds like a feasible approach, and yeah, reporting it back and to to the scheduler, so you can access this information after. Cool. Yeah. So I mean, the challenge is going to be how we can you know not run into DB races or something because. That's been the contention with the Coda system. So if you have a burst of activity, how do we, um, you know, not like uh, fudge the numbers or something uh, because of some, because of this round trip to the database um, as, as, as things are, uh, as shares have been created or deleted. Um, so that's that's a part that's still going to be a, a challenge right now. That 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 problem exists even with the conservative calculation that we're making in the scheduler service. So this allocated capacity GV that that's there. There is, uh, I mean, between the time that the backends report their allocated capacity G GV as it changes, um, the, the scheduler tries to keep tab of these of these numbers. And it tries to be pessimistic saying, oh, I've already allocated a bunch of uh, this thing as each provisioning request comes through. And we we still have like a, a skew over there uh, because there, are, there could be multiple schedulers and each one of them has a different picture of what's going on. Um, so that's going to be a similar challenge to, uh, to solve once we move this data into the, uh, into the share manager service. Um, so we'll have to think through this and maybe we'll, we'll, we'll brainstorm some more during code reviews. <clears throat> Yeah, sure. And um, while we're here, I think one other issue that was going on is uh, this max over subscription ratio uh, is basically uh, mm -hmm. trying to say uh, how uh, how much are we oversubscribing any sh any pool, right? And by default, this is uh, set to twenty. So we're saying if a if a pool is uh, you know supports ten gigabytes worth of shares, uh, we're actually uh, you know, uh, is going to support provisioning 20x that. Um, that's the that's kind of what the max over subscription ratio is, suppo uh, is supposed to mean, at least at the first go. And and the 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 problem with that is how what do you determine this number to be? Uh, and and it it if you as an uh, administrator wants to some do something like set and forget, this is probably a weird number uh, because you really don't know uh, at the get go what your cloud is going is going to uh, get used like what a single storage pool is going to get used like and stuff. Um, so I saw what uh, you know. It, I think this happened in a, in the past few uh, cycles. Cinder now has a way to just uh, allow Cinder to do that calculation for you, uh, and that is based on uh, the math that's here on on the on the Etherpad, um, where they allow the max over subscription ratio to be adjusted over time based on what is the used capacity on the on the back end. So as the used capacity keeps increasing, um, we we now have you know the uh, over subscription keeps reducing. Uh, so if if the used capacity goes back to uh, you know reduces, then the oversubscription actually increases and stuff. So it's a little more dynamic uh, and does not rely on guessing games um, from the administrator. Uh, so this would be, uh, an, at least this could be, this could definitely improve this stuff and it could be an opt-in uh, feature because uh, if you, if the administrator still wants to set some deterministic value, like say 20, they can still do that. They And they can do this per backend right today. 
um, but if they want to do this, uh, it, want want to let Manila calculate it, it would be more or less like this, where we uh, where we calculate the provisioning ratio and then determine if what the oversubscription ratio should be adjusted to be. So that's the other uh, improvement that I wanted to suggest for uh, this whole process. Yeah, that sounds like a nice idea and also like a good way to to have this thing more dynamic. Uh, yeah, uh, the, as I mentioned, uh, do you think we are okay only like uh, working on the change and then we can create like a, a blueprint for that? And, or we should need something more elaborate, like a spec, for example, for it. I think a spec is, uh, a spec is necessary, especially because, I mean, we could just take what we've kind of brainstormed on this etherpad down into a spec. Um, and, and writing a spec will also be fun because I really want us to put this in the docs. Uh, right now, the, besides just having, you know, the, the option documentation, I don't think there is anything, which kind of leads me to worry if anybody is even using this, um, or maybe they just assume that it just works um, and they just ha set the values and stuff. So that's the deal. Uh, so we can we can definitely write a spec, at least for the documentation sake and to uh, familiarize the idea of what's going on here. What do you Great. think, Axie? Awesome. I think, it, yeah, that'd be great, uh, Axie. We yeah. can uh, go yeah. back and forth. What? What? Okay. Um, I would like to add uh, any more thoughts on this. Uh, uh, I know the Sundar project also has this problem. Uh, yeah, uh, and while drafting uh, this spec, we can uh, take a look and uh, at their approach for solving this issue and we can uh, try to take some, some good things out of it. Well, we're here though. Um, so has anyone here uh, played around with max oversubscription ratio and tried to oversubscribe pools and run into any issues right now uh, the way Manila does it? Uh, okay. Yeah, it's uh, it's quite an esoteric feature. I would expect us to actually hone it and document it uh, before we start seeing issues with this. Because um, I, I mean, for for a long time we've just had it in the code, but I I doubt it was well used, and unless we our automated tests were calling out something like this. It's also hard for us to actually test this functionally besides, you know, um, trying to, you know, create a bunch of shares and see how the normal operation uh, would look like, which we are doing. Uh, but if you were to try to test, okay, is the oversubscription ratio uh, being honored um, when a burst activity is happening or something like that, uh, that sort of a thing is going to be hard because we don't really uh, test dynamic uh, updates 
uh, of the configuration or something in the in the CI. So that's been a problem. If you have any bright ideas uh, for how to test this stuff, uh, especially the scheduler, we kind of wrote the dummy driver with the idea that we're going to use that more to test the scheduler. Um, but we're now using it for all the fancy features. But and I'm not sure, you know, with the Tempest test framework, this is uh, this is very feasible. We got to actually have a whole uh, another kind of functional testing for the for the scheduler. Awesome. Uh, thanks for the feedback, Maurice. So you use more Max. Can I ask what you're setting the oversubscription ratio to? Okay. Awesome. So you set it to three. That's useful information. Uh, NetApp driver support, supports reporting the, the how, how much is the use. I think this is not your, the, the bug only shows up when the backup file, uh, backend driver does, uh, file doesn't report. The yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, exactly. So if, uh, yeah, I, I'm not totally familiar. Uh, but if, if I remember right, NetApp also had no way to actually look at the allocated numbers and at least not with the initial APIs. Um, I don't know if that has changed. So are you able to see, okay, uh, you know, the, the, the physical, not the physical, rather the, uh, the total allocation across the pool? Um, well, uh, what do we do? No, we, in Manila, we don't we don't use this information. I see. We 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 have a NetApp exporter to to export this. Well, this information is useful, but uh, I think uh, in Manila we use physical capacity uh, uh, used uh, capacity. I see. So it's possible that this calculation is actually helping you uh, that that Manila is doing because you are using uh, a, a, a you are using oversubscription. You set the number to three, uh, and I'm looking at the NetApp driver right now, and it does not report uh, provision capacity GB. So there is like this. Uh, I mean, this problematic calculation that we're talking about uh, is happening in the scheduler, but maybe you're not seeing the implications of it um, going wrong. Uh, so we are seeing, we, we, we're noticing it going wrong in like automated tests where we're running it with uh, a uh, concurrency of eight or 16 or something. Uh, so we're like bombarding the uh, scheduler with a lot of create re delete requests. Uh, and while that's happening with each request, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing, you know, once in a while, um, the scheduler just uh, blows up uh, while performing that calculation. So that may not be uh, you know happening in like a real cloud uh, it's possible because it is something that we don't know uh, how to reproduce ourselves yeah we don't have uh, full backends <laughs> yeah that's that's another thing cuz yeah exactly we're we're talking about the edge and corner cases where backends are filling up yeah makes sense thanks for sharing though yeah, thanks. That's yep. good feedback. Yeah. Okay. Um, would you guys uh, like to add something else? Uh, any more thoughts? I think we are uh, a few minutes over on this chat. And then uh, if not, we can jump to the uh, next one. I think I'm good. And uh, we have some to do. Yeah. Cool. Uh, thank you. So uh, let's go to the next topic then, uh, which is the NetApp on tap migration from Zappi to REST. Uh, it's uh, a topic from Nain and Fabio. Uh, Nain and Fabio, uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Carlos. Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, we are going to present. Uh, the what we are doing for the migration from Zappi to REST uh, on the Net, NetApp driver. Uh, 
first thing, uh, I think Fabio has a, a presentation to, to share, if we can. <laughs> uh, just a, a few slides to show uh, the solution we are implementing and uh, to explain the solution we are proposing. Uh, Fabio is going to start explaining the problem and I will uh, explain a little better the architecture in the, in the end. Uh, sure, go ahead. Uh, Fabio, please go ahead. Uh, can you share your screen? Okay. Uh, I guess I can I can share, but. Okay, let me. I'll try to change some permissions. Uh, could you please try now, Fabio? Okay. Uh, I... <laughs> uh, everyone is seeing? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, we will talk about our, our migration from Zappi to REST. Uh, it will be main. Uh, here are the, the topics that we are going to cover today. Uh, we also added the Etherpad, so you can uh, write down there your your thoughts or your, or your issues that you think that it will be necessary to, to have. And then we can take a look over there, and, uh, skip just the, the presentation and, and see what is written down there. Uh, how we, we do our request to ONTAP today? Uh, we have our NetApp driver, our driver file that uh, calls the Zappi client and it uh, calls the our cluster via soup. Uh, it is working pretty well for, for a while. It's stable and it, uh, it works fine today. Then uh, why do we want to change it? Why do we, we, we use REST if it's stable for a while? For the, the future versions, uh, Zappi will be removed, uh, especially, specifically, I guess, the 9.30. Uh, it will, no longer we will have Zappi. Uh, to prepare for that, we, we will start the migration. Uh, well, uh, when it started on on tap, it started on 9.6, so some functions were ported to REST. Now we are on 9.10. We have a lot of functions on, on REST already on the on tap side. Uh, but we don't have any on on OpenStack, so we started supporting it. Uh, I guess thank you. Uh, so uh, as Fabi said, that that's the idea. Uh, from on tap nine thirteen, Zappi will not be supported, and what we are doing now is is like a, a transition from from Zappi to, to REST. So the idea during this transition was, is to add a layer uh, in the, the picture, there's a kind of REST client uh, and the Net, NetApp driver will always try to make requests through the REST uh, client. And after that, uh, if for some reason the, the, the REST is not supported yet, uh, it can be because of the, the ONTAP version or because uh, it's still not implemented. So it will fall back to Zappi. So uh, this is to keep the compatibility for the customers that uh, are using other versions of uh, OpenStack or, or, or a different version of ONTAP. So this is the, the, the main idea uh, during this transition. Uh, please, please move next, Fabio. Uh, here, there's a, a picture uh, 
more detailed about the architecture. So today we have the NetApp driver uh, communicating with the what we call client C mode. Uh, these two two uh, modules, two two classes in in green. Uh, it's it's a just a simple diagram, simplified diagram. But these two two uh, modules are the are related to Zappi. So today the NetApp driver make a request for Zappi and uh, the C mode client make the request for uh, in a server that has the uh, connection logic that makes the request for on tap. Uh, please next. And this is the idea uh, we are implementing uh, for the rest of, during the, this transition. So the what we added uh, a new layer uh, for REST uh, and both before the, the Zappi. So uh, if something happens and REST cannot be executed, uh, it will fall back to Zappi. And the idea is that in the future, we will be able to remove uh, uh, the Zappi related uh, classes and we will be able to have only REST. Uh, we are doing this in Cinder uh, right now. Uh, we intend to do this on Cinder for the Z release and on Manila for the, uh, let's say AA release, double A release, I don't know, uh, the next release after that. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, the idea is to, to present here uh, the solution and uh, a few problems we, we, we are, seen uh, trying to solve before they happen. Uh, we have a problem that uh, many customers are using uh, old OpenStack releases. So uh, if we are part, if you are doing this transition in Z and in, in, in double A for, for Manila, uh, many customers that are using uh, OpenStack train, for example, uh, because they use RASP 16 or, or something like that, they will not be able to have the support for, for Zappi uh, after NetApp deprecates uh, the Zappi functions. And that's a problem because uh, if they update the on tap, but then does not, if they don't update the OpenStack, uh, the, the driver will stop working. So this is a problem and RASP 16 is based in train. And if I'm not wrong, RASP 17 will be based on Wallaby. So uh, I, I, we know that uh, uh, in general, uh, it's the, the idea is to backport only bug fixes, but we are trying to understand if it's possible to, to make an exception for this case. Uh, since it's a, a, a driver uh, specific uh, feature and that could cause problem to the to the users in the future. Uh, please move next, Fabio. Uh, can I just oh, add a point? Sure. Uh, regarding new bugs on Zappi, they won't have a fix because uh, as it's only as a, it already doesn't have the, the support. So it, we will only have what is developed right now. So in the future, new bugs, even if they don't update uh, on that backend or and keep with OpenStack code releases, uh, new bugs won't have a, a fix on, on that side because they are really deprecating the, the Zappi. Yes, yes, that's important too. Uh, and it's basically it. We, we have now two, two patches on the Cinder, Cinder site. Uh, the first one was the one we implemented the, the client itself, the, the architecture for the REST client. And the second one is the, the migration from uh, the functions we are migrating right now. So it's work in progress. Uh, we grouped the changes uh, in this patch uh, to present here, uh, if you want to to take a look at the at the the link later, uh, 
but we we also don't know uh, if this is the better solution or if we should split the patch in uh, categorizing like uh, according to to the features or uh, like uh, the matrix support for for cinder or vanilla i, I don't know uh, it, we need to, to discuss that also uh, but i think that's it uh, if fabio do you have anything else no, uh, just regarding the patches, <clears throat> right now we are uh, porting the, the functions in different patches. So one is for great volume, another one for, for attached volume. So it is already split, uh, but it group for for the, but it, it's uh, in a downstream environment, and we group to to send upstream to so you guys can see it. But we can talk about it. Uh, 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 there are some some thoughts that we already get from the the last meeting that we had talking about the smaller patches for for review and i don't know how we we should apply here because it grouped all all of them grouped it's a really huge patch but we can talk about it how to, to do it uh, and, and that's it for for Yes, I, I know that on Manila uh, in the, the past, Carlos already implemented uh, a few functions for REST, right? And basically on Cinder, we, we did a um, very similar solution well, with a uh, few changes. Just in Manila, there is already a REST client. We are going to need to change a little bit, but, uh, but uh, not so much. <laughs> It will need a few changes in the REST client and the, the migration of the functions after that. Uh, that's it. Uh, I'll stop sharing so we can take a look on the later pad. I don't know if it's written down or had some issues. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, uh, some time for discussion now. Uh, I see there are some some things on the discussion side here already. Uh, I think Gotham read it. Then would like to comment on this, Gotham. Yeah, the biggest concern here for me and for yourselves is uh, testing stable branches. As you're aware, uh, you know the CI system is not really the most perfect thing. So are you doing anything proactively uh, for this? What is the plan? That's kind of what I wanted to find out. Yep. Uh, what, what we have now is, is that it, it's able for us to prepare an environment to test, uh, to run Tempest uh, like man, manually, but uh, not, not on the CI for now. Uh, our CI is not working for this Older, older branches, but we would be able to uh, make like manual tests and run Tempest, uh, create a few Tempest tests and, and run Tempest in the in these older branches. But that's the initial idea. Yeah, I I, I would say that like uh, considering our the the status of our current CI, maybe we could like a uh, commit for example to master minus two as like uh, automatically like a uh, running and like uh, every new patch will automatically trigger as, as we have today and commit with like a minus one or minus two releases for, for having it like uh, deployed in RCI to have like a stable, uh, stable branches being tested. But in, for example, um, for in the case of like uh, OSP 16, that we would really, we would really want to uh, continue, continue and serving customers with like a, uh, with like the, the 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 current support and also uh, I I don't think that that like uh, or or like we have customers that just up, uh, upgraded their environment to OSP sixteen they were using like uh, OSP thirteen until like a uh, one year ago uh, less than one year ago so. And we know that like migrating clouds, like upgrading clouds is something that like will consume, cons it's time consuming, it's like expensive. Uh, there, there are risks involved and like uh, 
uh, the players will not like uh, uh, like uh, uh, they don't want to continuously upgrade uh, stuff like not that it's it will depend on the on each one strategies but like we see that some co that some customers are not going to make uh, upgrades like uh, in time soon so uh, uh, what what like uh, considering that like train would be a, 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 a optimal target for us like uh, I would say like that for every patch for example in order to uh, to uh, have a patch for the stable train we would run the uh, uh, all the CI tests manually we could report for example we could report or uh, report the the status in the patch itself or have like a uh, either pad with like each each result each results before like a uh, I don't know like what you folks would, would think would be the best solution here but uh, uh, what I would say that like we can we can execute and make sure that the tempests are running for every stable every stable branch maybe not all will be uh, not uh, all of them will be uh, an in, in RCI but we can like for example deploy environment and execute the 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 tempest tests uh, manually and output the results and logs and also the configurations we use so we can kind of like do agreement on what would be the minimal information necessary and like a go with that yeah, i don't know like we already had something like that for for scene we already had a train deployed and we run the tempest for a backward that we had to do for for train so it's something that is doable yeah that's fine that's kind of what uh, i mean you would typically do in case you're backporting anything risky and we're not able to test it with tempest 2 right um because i, I mean the truth of the matter is that tempest is not like 100 percent covering all of yeah. every possible corner case even uh and it's for the most part positive api testing uh really so uh, I, I mean, it gives me a little bit of confidence that if you're at least using that as a regression suite, and I think you know may, uh, or you'll probably go beyond that with your uh, internal tempest tests and stuff um, for us to actually take this even to the last released stable branch. Um, mm -hmm. That's the the thing. For where it gets concerning for me is if this is part of something that's. Uh, uh, train for instance yeah, uh, yeah and so that is done we are we are not producing any more releases there uh there the, the the branches are only there for us to uh you know take minor uh and critical bug, bug fixes and backports um yeah. so that's where I, i'm like i don't think honestly with with a stable maintainers hat i can i, I can think a, ma a major change like this would even qualify there mm. um so we would you have to probably for train, right? Like, yeah, for train, yes. Yeah, uh, like um, uh, uh, what I'm, um, I, I like, you know, like for the at least for train, the target would be like a, a Red Hat uh, OpenStack platform. So I don't know, like, uh, if uh, for example the fork that like uh, Red Hat have would uh, actually uh, still uh, be able to to uh, bring this kind of like changes or if it's in the same situation as the community repos where like there it, there will no uh there's not going to be any further uh release uh, not sure exactly like in which phase and we uh osp 16 is currently in but my uh, like a you know like a we don't actually need to have it like a in train uh for for the for the open source because i believe that for open source we can considering something like a victoria or like a uh or for the, the main half was we could have like some less uh something that's still being released released uh but like we are trying to address the the uh, also address customers that um are relying on, on train with this like uh, getting getting uh, old and Red Hat is providing like a, a very long-term support for them. So it's kind of like, a, 
you know, like uh, we know that, uh, uh, like uh, the uh, OSP 16 is not in the same pace as what we have on the, on the the official HAPOS, the community HAPOS. So we are uh, this kind of change is difficult to to address. I don't know, like if we should have a separate conversation with the OSP folks, like if there there are people yeah, that you you should. I mean, what Red Hat does is. Uh... I mean, really, Red Hat's problem, right? So technically, this is, uh, I mean, for the up, upstream community, uh, mm -hmm. we have the stable guidelines, um, which, I mean, technically, because uh, you know, the it it costs us a lot as a community to maintain CI on these older mm -hmm. releases. Um, so if uh, Red Hat has as a way to do this, or any other distro for that matter. Uh, has a commitment to to support customers for a longer time, uh, then I'm sure they have ways to uh, take this uh, and probably, you know, or give you other options kinds. Um, yeah. Okay. So we should probably, you know, limit ourselves to what the community should can test over here and including yourselves, you guys are going to have to test with the upstream code. Um, so, I mean, as these releases become really, really old. I don't think you have uh, the bandwidth or the uh, tools to continue maintaining tests for this. Um, so that's that's point number one. Uh, if you if you're able to provide some sort of stable testing with the branches that we are still releasing, uh, then it, it it makes sense for us to consider the backports and how do how do we do this testing? How do we post on the patches and how do we be sure uh, we're not breaking anything? Uh, we can definitely take a look on that. Um, on the other, uh, the other side, though, okay. is there a way that uh, a customer um, can opt into this? Like the is, it, I, I can I cannot get too far into your into the documents that you've uh, linked in the uh, presentation, uh, but it says that this was introduced in ONTAP nine point seven, and is uh, and I mean this being REST was introduced. Or rather, uh, solidified in on tap nine point seven, and being and the uh, um, support for the older on tappy uh, is going away in nine point thirteen. Um, I mean, reading semverse, it kind of feels quite uh, drastic to me that we are that a that a major API that was in use um, is being you know removed in a minor release. Uh, but I guess that's not something. You no, you classify huge. them as minor releases, but NetApp <clears throat> classifies them still as as major releases. Uh, okay. I agree that at nine point six, when we switched to REST, it should have gone to version ten or eleven or whatever we would have had next, since it used to be a version ten. Uh, but I'm not in charge of versioning. But yes, it's still considered a major release, and it was from decisions from made by people way above this call. So I see. Okay, so customers are aware that this is no, it's not a minor upgrade from 9.6 to 9.7 or something like that, right? Um, yeah, most everything we have still still works. Like our, all our actual modules speak both SAPI and, and, and REST that we're going through now. That's why we want to do this with the OpenStack drivers so that customers as they go from 9.5 to 9.6 and above don't have disruption in their access. Uh, but yeah, 9.13, there will be no Zappy drivers. So if they're using a Zappy only version of uh, ONTAP or sorry, of OpenStack or something, uh, and they upgrade their ONTAP system to 9.13, it will break. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And how is this compatibility being provided elsewhere, like the Ansible modules, et cetera, the same way, which is you hit the rest, it doesn't work. You, you Yeah, so so what we, we've done with the Ansible module, because I'm, I'm the, the program manager or the project manager for, for both uh, development teams. Um, the modules uh, check to see if the REST API is available. If it is, they check if the options that are being called in the Ansible module are available, uh, because as REST was made more robust from 9.6 to 9.7 to 9.8 to 9.9, um, options were added. Uh, if all those things match, it runs via REST. If one of those things fail, it falls back to Zappy currently. Obviously at 9.13, there is no Zappy. There will be no Zappy to fall back to, uh, but we're doing everything we can so that there's no disruption to customers and nothing they have to check because 
the vast majority of customers that are using these things aren't trying or concerning themselves with the API calls directly. They just expect things to work. And so that's what we're trying to put in and have be this access point to make a decision that was made as least impactful on end users as possible. Okay, and what is your timeline for getting this into Manila? Uh, it would, uh, the, like the patching master would arrive in the BOA. Okay. Okay, so currently we are focused on bringing uh, the like a, something around 90 or 100% of the functions ported for Cinder until the end of that. So we are currently focused on Cinder right now. So for, for Manila, we should, like uh, our target is to at least uh, merge the Zappy clients and maybe some uh, driver initialization functions, like something something minor right now. And so we have some time for, for testing in master, at least for, for, for not for testing, but for like a, for initial validation to see if like a, to get more reviews during this, this release and, and the, net, the next one. So our, our, our targets to have something merged on this release, but targets to have like a, the, the code uh, completely ported till the end of next release. So it's going to be double A where these uh, at the main patch with like a 100 of 100% of the functions will be uh, ported and the one that we target to merge. And as you said, like uh, I would say that like uh, we can we can try to, uh, for example, have like uh, to get all the versions uh, the, that we we still released, I believe that Victoria is still being released, right? Yeah, but yeah, for some yeah. time. For some time, yeah, for just another few weeks. Yes, exactly. In few weeks, uh, it's uh, no longer uh, like yeah. The the release policy will change. There is uh, an email in the open stack discuss uh, mentioning that it's supposed to be like uh, April twenty seventh, I think. Uh, okay yeah uh yeah so maybe at the time we were uh we we were able to merge and the, the patch master probably wallaby would would be the late the, the the like the old oldest version until with uh releases right probably i don't know if xena or wallaby i would hope wallaby because wallaby is will be osp, osp 17 will be uh, will we use Wallaby? So, yeah, I would say that Wallaby would be a minimum for us and in order to, uh, to make it happen. But yeah. what do you think, guys? Do you think like, what, uh, at, like at the end of uh, double A, Wallaby will still be uh, maintained or should, like from, from your back experience? Yeah, likely. I mean, we're uh, that depends though on the. Uh, I mean, so every release that we're moving forward, we kind of drop the oldest release. So mm -hmm. right now, if you're dropping Victoria, um, yeah, you, you can. I mean, Wallaby may not be up for for this thing when AA releases. Uh, so I mean, it might be there around when you're merging stuff into AA, but um, after mm -hmm. AA releases, we might just sunset Wallaby. Yeah, we can. Uh, yeah, we can try to uh, have it like a uh, have it proposed earlier in in AA in AA, so we have more time to to get like a it merged on Wallaby as well. So maybe let let's see what we can do at at the time. Yeah, I think like I don't know if there are uh, no, uh, I don't. Mar is Maurice in this call? Yes, or anyone is writing on the yes i'm here ah, he's right yeah sorry let me see yeah i'm kind of concerned 
because I know that like uh, the SAP folks, they they have. I don't know if they are currently focused on uh, Victoria right now or something like that. So we would Ooh, like. We to are. We are. It. We are on. We are on Xena right now, running. Ah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Good to know. Like, uh, yeah. If we're already on Xena, then like for sure we should have like a, a way to address uh, a, 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 a patch with the the changes for 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 you. Uh, so maybe yeah, um, um, I'm a bit slow on, on writing this. This um, uh, my question: um, what determines which client is used? So the way I understand this is that there is a kind of a discovery that it looks what uh, what onta version I have on the back, and then it decides if it is supported. It uses it uses REST, and if not, it uses um, the old one, the that RP. Yes, um, exactly. What, what my my fear is uh, because mis mistakes happen. So uh, either um, the uh, the way the methods are implemented are not exactly the same between that RP or a REST, or uh, so on on tap side or or on the driver side, uh, each of that can happen that I more quickly want to have the possibility to switch back to the old method uh, you mean without like a... having to change the code. Um, so, so that's yeah. my fear. I, 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 run, I run this out in production and I, and I see an issue occurring and I quickly want to say, uh, well, please use the old method because there is some Yes, yes, a new one. Yeah. Yeah. For, for sure, we can provide that. It's something that we need for, for like uh, testing purposes. So yes, for sure, like uh, we can provide the option for like uh, enforcing a, a specific uh, client tool. So instead like uh, you, like uh, uh, operators would be able to enforce like a uh, Zappies or REST depending on the configuration. For REST, we understand that that nine eight would be a minimum. So, for example, if you have uh, uh, if you have clusters running on tap nine dot seven, uh, the driver would automatically start, uh, switch to Zappies and run Zappies, and uh, never is the is the the, the option you. You set since like uh, REST has some limitations until at least nine point eight, so it's important to like so like at nine eight it must be must be zappy, and for next for for the newers the newers that 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 will be a choice, like uh, uh, the idea is that like a. Uh, if you yeah. you didn't set any kind of uh, option, uh, the driver will decide for you. So the driver will look at the the current clusters version. We'll check like uh, if it can run Zappies. We'll trigger Zappy. Uh, we'll tr no, sorry. Uh, it, it it can run uh, rests. We'll execute rests, and in case of like uh, there is something some uh, missing. Uh, uh, function if missing implement uh, implemented function, it will use Zappy instead. So this is kind of the, the, the logic. And, and you, you mean to make that determination at driver startup or do you want to do that on a per Zappy basis? Uh, we, we plan to do it by like a, a based on like, uh, the idea is to basically, uh, we have like based on each of on tap version, we know like the functions that are already implemented and it's going to be like, a, a, it's going to be, kind of implicit like uh, for the driver for the functions that are currently uh, we have like a uh, two two different clients clients one for zappy and one for rest and for the the functions that are not implemented in the rest client it will be uh, redirected to the zappy clients so this is kind of like a uh, we are not going to check the the uh, the rest if the function exists because we have the documentation that already uh, ensures that. So we have like a, a kind of a decorator where we are going to specify in it like a, a for each like a function the 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 version and that rest started supporting it. So for example, we say that this version is supported only on nine ten, for example. So even if we have it uh, 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 
uh, if we are running, for example, 9.8 and the, the, it's implemented in the, in the, the REST site, uh, the driver will automatically switch to Zappi and run the Zappi call because it's not like a, 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 a supported, uh, you are not using a cluster that supports the, the, the that operation. So I don't know if I, like, I explained it, it like, I could rephrase that if, Oh, I think you're fine. I guess I get the point. It's like your features uh, matrix that you have and you want to actually tag uh, APIs to these different uh, versions so that you can use the APIs only starting with if you have detected that particular version. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's that's the goal. So there's two two points that we, we use. Like we uh, there's two situations where a function can be uh, like a uh, where we can uh, flip to, uh, like swap to to Zappi. One is if the is if like the driver call uh, doesn't uh, if the the if the REST client doesn't have like a, a a a function at all. So for example, you have like the function create like a, like a, for example like a create a QoS policy something like that. And if it's not implemented on the REST client, it's going to switch to, to Zappi and execute the same operator, uh, operation there. And in case it has, before executing the REST operation, before like uh, making, before like uh, uh, executing, like uh, using REST, there will be like a, 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 a validation check to, to, to see if like the cluster version is it uh, corresponds to a, a supported version for for that function. So suppose we have like a created QoS. This is an example. This is like uh, QoS something that. But suppose supposing that create uh, QoS is something that was only implemented on nine ten. Then we would have like uh, uh, we would have like the uh, decorator saying it's like only supported on nine ten on our order, and before the function's execution, there will be a check that will will see if cluster is um, have like the supported version, otherwise it's call it is going to call a Zappi. So even if you make any changes to the customers that are currently uh, running uh, their configurations, they wouldn't. They won't need to make any specific uh, uh, change to their configuration file to to make it uh, to start using uh, uh, REST or to like uh, to uh, decide like or to for example upgrade or all their cluster uh, all their clusters to nine eight or later in order to 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 make their their cloud working again so based on the driver will make this decision based on the, the cluster version. And the idea is to have it uh, uh, for a while until uh, at least we we are able to f fully uh, the commission Zappi. I think yeah. the, the big advantages of this approach that Fernando mentioned is that we can port the functions uh, not everything we can part uh, one part and another part so we can transition the transition can be uh, made by parts so it will help us on implementing uh, reviewing and also backporting those changes since we have the the base uh, the base uh, infrastructure as nine uh, showed so since we have that we can start implementing part of this the, the functions to the rest and then side to backpart them. So it will help us, us during the developments. Yeah, totally, that makes sense. And also helps with review, because uh, we don't want to see a giant yeah. patch with a lot of APIs and we won't know what to do kinds as reviewers. Um, the, yep, uh, the other thing, on the up, uh, on the override stuff, I, I I was I had a similar thought, and part of the reason I wanted to uh, say that is because Ontappy has had a lot of soak time, um, and a lot of testing over multiple releases. And if you're planning to introduce this in a release and try to backport it soon, uh, kind of a thing, you're you're reducing that amount of soak time. So, uh, giving your customers and an, or the users a way to override that would probably be helpful. Uh, mm -hmm. in, not paint them in a corner sorts. Yeah, sure. 
Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, and how long is this? Uh, I mean, probably not relevant completely, but how long is each of these ONTAP releases uh, supported? And at what point is the ONTAP code from Manila going to disappear? 9.12, which should release at the end of this year, will be supported for a minimum of two years after its release. Okay, so you're saying 9.6 is already, uh, has it been two years since, or what is the uh, minimum? Two releases version? a year right now. Um, so 9.11 is either just released or being released shortly, um, but not every release has the same year time. I'd have to look up what the, the support is. Let me see if I can find that. Makes sense also to try and plan uh, around the thing as to what is the expediency of this for uh, users that we support or rather that we want to support if they start filing bugs against Manila, for instance. Um, okay, uh, 9.6 is uh, full support, uh, ends June 30th, uh, limited support, uh, extends till 2024. 9.7's uh, full support ends January 1st, 2023. 9.8's full support ends December 31st, 2023. Uh, 9.9 is 2024, June 30th for full support. 9.10 is 2025, January. So 9.11 will be December of 2025. 9.12 will be January of 2026. And then 9.13 will be 20.27. But 9.13 has no zappy. So 20.26 is the runway for um, on-tap releases still supported that have zappy. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. And we've been we've been communicating this to customers uh, that Zappy's going away, and and OpenStack isn't the only uh, uh, project and and program that's having uh, these kind of headaches. It's it was just a, a massive decision, and now everything we do is is being converted to to be um, rest. Yep. Okay, cool. Um, I guess, yeah, we could talk more about this during our weekly meetings. I'm sure as you as you get more patches in, we, we get an idea of what the backports will look like. Yeah. Um, and stuff. Yeah, and we can uh, like discuss a testing plan for this too. And then we can define some criteria for each one of the patches how that you submit. So yeah, we can have like some common agreement on what should be tested and uh, what will be the outputs that the reviewer or well, outputs from CI or even from manual testing that the reviewers will be willing to see. Right, um, any more thoughts on this discussion? There is a question on line 52. I'm not sure if it was already answered. Oh, yeah. Thanks for bringing it up. Yeah. Uh, will administrators need to uh, restart Manila if there is an untap upgrade? I don't think so. <laughs> Hey, sorry, folks. Uh, can you, uh, Carlos? Can you repeat? Like, uh, I was trying to. Uh, I was sending a message to the. Uh, I was talking to the the senior folks, just asking. Then we had like a current uh, presentation uh -huh. for for on the senior side as well. So I asked them to just flip the 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 schedules and uh, the the uh, flip the topic. So we get we are going to get like half a minute to finish this discussion. Yeah. Uh, can you repeat your question? So yeah, um, basically, Morris was asking if uh, he would need to restart Manila Share if uh, there is an untapped upgrade. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, let me think. I was trying to uh, think on that. Yeah. Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. I need to check specifically if we have some kind of caching mechanism for the, I, yeah. For, yeah, I, I can take a look and I will answer it like as soon as possible. I I don't think so. And yeah, like uh, we could have uh I, I think like we we just like every time this is not like the same situation for Cinder, but for Manila, every time we need a version, we just go to the, the cluster and ask for it. So basically I pretty sure uh I, like almost sure that the no re, no epic no restart will be necessary since like the validation is entirely based on the uh, like a, we are we are saying like an, an upgrade in the ONTAP side, not as in, in, in like, of course like if, if we did, we change the OpenStack code, it will require a restart. But uh, if it's like a, we are upgrading the clusters, it won't require a a, a, a restart. Uh, since like a, it's basically uh, the next the next operation is going it's going to to trigger will require a, a call to get the version the version will be uh will be gathered from from the from the cluster and the new version will be uh result in arrest uh, uh like of course like uh, if the 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 operator decide to continue with zappy's uh support it will be able to specify like a flag in the configuration fly uh, configuration file and continue with zappy and test it in their environment in their test environment first and before before like uh, running it in production so maybe we i would like uh, uh we could have this uh the setting to to uh to, to uh, select the the client mode or the client type to uh, to continue being zappy for for the next releases and at least until we we are fully uh, like a weekend we can claim claim fully so uh, full support yeah kind of stuff. so yeah there's uh, I don't know if I have uh, more time for it but there's another question like that means uh, uh, no I, I added a mention here to uh, comment you did like that the driver will have kind of a fallback mechanism where like if the rest call is not available, then the driver will try to use that instead. Uh, not only not available, you mentioned, but if it fails, it will, the driver will try to fall back to using Zap instead. So uh, Maurice also asked if uh, that means if like uh, his user does not have permission, uh, security logging application HP to use rest, but can use on Tappy, it will work. Uh, and yeah. Uh, let me see. Nine, do you, yes, do you uh, have like more? Yeah, go ahead. I, I'm not sure if if on tap has some kind of configuration to uh, security configuration and to allow specifically Zappy or a rest. Yes, yes, it have. Yeah, it it, it so, has. So. Yes, it is. Uh, it may I be a problem. That... <laughs> yeah. So and it's it may be a problem. Yes. That, that was that's a good point, actually. I think the here is, is more about the uh, the development. When you're developing, you should like checking the error and see if it's the error comes from uh, REST uh, is not supported or REST doesn't have that function. You should fall back. So it depends on how you implement this. Uh, we haven't implemented yet for for Manila, uh, so we could uh, when you start implementing this, uh, take a look on this specific uh, scenario. So it's just about the implementation. Yes, uh, just a comment. I, I'm not sure if I understood correctly, but what we were you were discussing. But today, uh, Zap uh, the the client will only fall back to Zappy if it's not available for some reason or in on tap or in OpenStack. If, uh, the, for example, if the client tries to execute REST uh, and something fails uh, like an exception in the REST execution, it will not fall back to Zappy. It will fail, it will return it an error. I don't know if it is, this was clear. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the problem, thank you. Oh, cool. In this scenario, 
fail for another reason, or it's just because you don't have you don't have access to this HTTP. So you will uh, end up with this implementation that you mentioned. You end up uh, in a error scenario instead of yeah. fall back into the to the. But this is that that is a decision that we we can take if you prefer like indeed yeah. indeed. End up in a error scenario and warn the user that the user must go and, and uh, enable this, or we we prefer to uh, always fall back to the Zap implementation. It's yeah, it's it's a good yeah. point. To discuss. Yep. Yeah. I think that for the security, uh, for at least for this, uh, like uh, because I, I think the problem is that like when when you uh, you you have like uh, Zappy configured. And you must also have HTTP uh, allow it for like a uh, if uh, for for rests so for rest calls so in case you you, you don't have it uh, then like it would be manually uh, changed in the, the on tap side and yes this is will this will be this is an issue but I, I believe that this can be easily solved solved like uh, we can have like a uh, when we are checking for versions we can uh, just have like a, a verification if if we get an error during validation we can check if it's like due to uh, 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 due to uh, like a, a, a like a security uh, not, uh, like a we, we, we can do what's necessary to fall back to Zappies in case uh, for certain for certain conditions, so I believe that yeah, this is a valid concern. It's something that wasn't in my yeah. We uh, let we we think on implementation for that, but we will definitely cover this this requirement as well. Yeah, this is important. I think that what's not going to happen is that like uh, we are not going to, for example, have a situation where you trigger like a, a create TOS policy. It fails for any reason. And we try a Zappy as like a, a workaround. This is not the idea because the idea is that like uh, the REST version of Create TOS is exactly the same as the Zappies. If it's in, for cases that where it's not exactly the same, we are making sure to provide the exactly same behavior. So uh, if you like, a, if you create a volume using like a, if our client create creates a volume using REST or Zappies, the idea is to have the exactly same uh, the same behavior for both both uh, clients. And we want to, uh, we are going to ensure that for like, uh, uh, this is a, a work that we are doing internally at, at NetApp as well. And yeah, so uh, so basically just, just cl uh, clarify this kind of situations can be, can result in a, in a, uh, in, in trigger Zappies instead, for example, this security, the problem with like uh, authorization, but uh, for um, for like a like a a, a a common error that uh, then it's going to fail accordingly. The driver will will not be aware. If, like it's going to it's going to be Zappies or rests, and we are not going to retry with Zappies to see cool. if it works. Yeah, cool. All right. Uh, thanks for the explanation. Uh, all right. Uh, any more thoughts on this? Uh, we are a few minutes late for the next session, but uh, yeah. I don't know if you guys would like to add something else. Uh, I don't think so. So the idea is to consider uh, we are going to propose a patch that will be considering for for like uh, the, 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 the the versions that are still released at the time so we are kind of in agreement here that we are not going to have uh, these patches uh, uh, backported to uh, main, uh, extend it uh, to the version to like to releases that are just maintained but that we don't have that we don't have further uh, releases so I would like uh, just like if you guys can maybe uh, send us like address us uh, like who we could talk internally at like uh, and uh, uh, we could like, someone that we could send a message to start this discussion around like uh, OSP 16 for for uh, 
someone at, at Red Hat, this would be awesome because uh, we know that probably we are uh, that we are not going to have it like merge it on for for train but how we can still deliver it for osp 16 uh this okay, will sure. be, uh, we, we can take that as a sidebar uh fernando yeah. okay yeah okay yeah, yeah. yeah. cool Okay, so uh, thanks Fernando, Naim, and uh, Nedapers and uh, people asking questions in this call and answering questions in this call. Uh, I think we can use a break. We have been on um, discussion for, for some time, but before the break, I would like to uh, ask you uh, if you could, if we could take like the uh, team photo now, uh, I will stop the recording and then we can have the break and then we can get back to it, to the discussions. Okay, so yeah, if that's okay to you, uh, if you'd like to, please open your cameras. Nice to see you all. <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say, it's a, this thing that Carlos is being too nice to you people, not asking you to turn on your cameras earlier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, I didn't do that myself, so. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Okay. One more. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Um, we will be back. Uh, I think uh, 10 minutes sounds reasonable. We can try to, to uh, fit the schedule uh, in when they get back. So yeah, uh, let's give a uh, 10 minutes break. I'll leave the timer up in the screen. And then uh, we can get back to uh, discuss uh, next is gonna be the uh, add support for automatic snapshot creations and removal. Right, so see you in 10 minutes. We thought would be, would be uh, good to have in Manila. So currently we have a periodic tasks uh, for various, uh, activities needed in Manila. So we decided to kind of extend those periodic tasks to add this functionality of automatic snapshots, creation and deletion for the share. Uh, can you open this spec? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Thanks. So basically uh, what we have is uh, we can provide uh, an option to the share create command. And there will be two options specifying the timeline uh, in minutes or hours for creating the snapshot, uh, uh, as well as for the deletion of the snapshot. And uh, during the periodic tasks, so there will be two periodic tasks running at the particular intervals and during uh, invocation or uh, when particular periodic task uh, will run, it will uh, check which shares are currently due for snapshots and then it will create a snapshot for that shares. Uh, these snapshots will be the automatic snapshots and kind of uh, hidden from the user. Uh, mostly uh, this facility is needed for uh, administrator. So uh, the admin user can view those snapshots. Uh, this is the, idea at the higher level. And then uh, there are some tweaks, like if you don't want to do the snapshot, you can basically disable this by using the share update command. Or if you want to change the interval, for example, if you are taking the snapshots quite frequently and you don't want those, you can basically update the creation and deletion time interval using the share update command. Yeah, so yeah, and in the spec, I have mentioned few alternatives. Uh, as uh, there were a few uh, comments specifically from Gautam and Hexin uh, regarding what are the alternatives. So, one alternative is kind of doing this by writing your own scripts. Uh, so anyone who wants to do kind of snapshotting can use any Manila client or REST API to 
perform this operation and keep track of keep track by themselves uh but i'm not sure most probably because this uh, will need a lot of work from the user and different user will have the different approach uh, another possibility is to kind of have some separate share type uh, specifying these intervals but then if different shares need a different interval we might end up creating a lot of share types and those will remain in the system until we kind of uh, make sure that no one in uses them uh, uses uh, those share types so most probably the current approach is kind of uh, feasible and should be acceptable yeah so apart from that pick i think i uh, there are pull request as well most probably in uh, working in progress mode uh, for this uh, blueprint see ya uh, uh, thanks for bringing it up uh, there are some uh, some discussions or questions here already uh so yeah uh so on some alternatives uh basically uh some would be uh, automating uh via manila client or rest api uh i mean uh, this yeah this, this could be some some good alternatives for this uh, use case to uh got them i, I see you added a comment you'd like to add something else about this yeah and and the primary concern here is that there's already the mechanisms to take these snapshots um so if if there and and there are probably already folks that have uh you know automated this in case they do want automatic snapshots what is it that uh, for example um, you know uh, you, you are you representing users that are already using manila or um are you designing this feature for some prospective user well i don't have the exact use case uh, but this is something kind of being uh, come as a feature or uh, enhancement that needs for user the that kind of makes sense but i was wondering if there is like a uh, you know some sort of precedence for this uh, or may, is there some some problem with the with automating it outside Uh, of manila that we want to make sure that we want this consistency and uh, you know api um, to to be enhanced like this okay so uh, well i right now i don't have uh, the information about like why uh, the, the best uh, scenario that i can think of for having this inside the code is to kind of provide this as a feature and stability and kind of uh, used by everyone to you no know, instead of like instead of having the individual scripts and all those but if apart from that if there is any other use case i'll uh, mention on the pull request uh, by discussing with the team internally yeah that would be very helpful cuz uh, i was trying to rack my brains especially around you know uh, how is this done let's say with another provisioning service Uh, and we over here have uh, the block storage system uh, cinder and and besides maybe if you're looking at other clouds uh, entirely azure and aws have they do have some way of managing uh, snapshots and scheduling them but i'm not sure if that if the code lives alongside this uh, the code that also takes these snapshots right so maybe this sort of a thing uh, is i mean you can you can add any and every kind of automation to this besides just being able to specify okay take snapshots at this interval um mm -hmm. because all, honestly this service is not built for that in the sense there is no uh, you know some there's no way of triggering based on a schedule right uh, right over here even over here with, when you're using periodic tasks these are static in a sense you're you're triggering uh, a task at a, at at a uh, 
predefined absolute interval to kick off and then look through the database to find your timers. Right. So there's we don't have a mechanism to just like start throwing uh, dynamic intervals at the, at, at these periodic tasks. Okay. So that's that's kind of why I mean I, I know that this service that I'm calling out is probably now dead in development or something. Uh, there used to be a uh, in a, a data production as a service project that had these. Uh, you know mechanisms, mm -hmm. and and if you if your use cases as simple as okay, I just need to have automatic snapshots, and I need to make sure that they're uh, coming via the API, um, because I mean it kind of makes sense, right? Uh, I think the uh, I mean prior to this, there if if not for you scripting your own automatic snapshot logic, if you wanted automatic snapshots, you pro and you, you were probably using a, um, a backend like ZFS on Linux or NetApp, uh, there is a way, or I think even with, uh, yeah, I don't think we have one with ZFS, but there is a way to create a snapshot policy directly on the backend. And, uh, and you let the backend manage the snapshots for you. So it'll just keep automatically taking these snapshots and, and, and uh, purging them uh, after the, uh, you know, expiry of that particular schedule or whatever. So it, we made some primitive, uh, pass-throughs to the storage backend so that you can get that capability directly from the storage backend. But I can understand what the dis, uh, what the limitation there is in the sense that A, these snapshots are not known, known to Manila. They're just happening somewhere. So they, they, mm -hmm. you can't really use them through Manila. Uh, so I get that motivation of trying to put things into the API. Uh, but I still don't understand why we cannot take this automation to some place which has better support for scheduling stuff um, than, than, than us, than the uh, Manila core code. Okay, so you mean a separate service? A separate service, it could be anything. It doesn't have to be an OpenStack service like what Carbor used to be, but um, you can think of a, a, a script that you could share or playbook uh, or an Ansible playbook that you could share uh, with, with everybody that, that has this issue. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay, fine. So, well, then I can think of it more and see what I can do. I'll, I'll prefer to reply on the spec if I, if I come up with something else. Absolutely. Yeah. So if there are motivating reasons, uh, I mean, there is absolutely no pushback on doing this. Uh, I'm just calling out that the vehicle that you're using is not perfect. Uh, so you may not get the results that you're shooting for. Uh, like for example, let's say you just set the timer to 15 minutes um, mm -hmm. on, on a share, but you're running the schedule interval every hour, right? So, or something like that. Uh, and, and maybe somebody wants to take snapshots once every two days um, or something like that. And you miss that interval. So it does not give you that the confidence that this is even uh, going to work as expected, right? You don't know when exactly the snapshot's being taken. You don't know it's actually happening every 15 minutes because there's a there's a disparity between the uh, configured interval at which we're picking up and creating these snapshots versus what the user is expecting when they're creating their shares. Okay, but in that case, uh, the interval at which this periodic task are running is configurable. So as an administrator, I can think of how frequent I need to take the snapshots or how frequent I need to run those periodic tasks. You, you sure can. So unless you set it to a minute or something, it probably <laughs> yeah. won't matter to your end users because they're all taking, you know, setting these schedules up in, in a completely different way. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I see. Then uh, that's it from me. Then thanks. Yeah, makes sense. So if you can come back, I don't know, with better motivating uh, uh, reasons why we need to do this, uh, that would be really interesting to us because we can. I mean, that like yeah, I guess yeah. no pushback, but more more about motivating us to uh, to solve this problem for for the for users. 
yeah even uh, i was even considering whether it should reside in manila or not but then i thought to better have a discussion that makes sense yeah yeah that's that's good thanks for bringing this up and yeah, yeah. Uh, we can continue the discussions over this back if you have like questions and if you also would like to bring up something uh during the weekly meetings please feel free to do so as well um, I don't know if you if I've shared that with you, but we have the weekly meetings for Manila happening uh, every when every Thursday at uh, 15 UTC. So yeah, uh, you can just edit the agenda if you'd like to, and then we can uh, discuss uh, have like your topic being discussed over the a weekly meeting on RC. Sure, thanks. Cool. All right, uh, any more thoughts, folks? Okay, I'll take that as a no. Uh, thank you for bringing this up again, uh, Kiran and Manish. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I think it's it's good to discuss these things and yeah, we can continue the discussions for this in the spec. All right, so we have then a, a next topic. Uh, I think we are a bit ahead in the schedule now. Uh, I don't know if uh, we have everybody from, uh, yes, I, we do, uh, from NDSU as well. So yeah, I think we can just con continue to the schedule and then go to the next topic which is the Manila UI updates uh, from Victoria and the NDSU students. So yeah, uh, floor is yours. Uh, Victoria, I see you're unmuted, but I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, perfect. So thank you, Carlos, and hi, everyone. Um, for today, we wanted to do a quick update on the current status of the Manila UI. Um, this, well, the first item that we have that we wanted to cover is about the current micro version support status. Um, right now, we are um, on the version 246, uh, which basically is Rocky. So uh, you can imagine how, how back we are on the support in the UI. Uh, and um, well, the, the different, well, the, the amount of changes we need to do in order to reach parity with the current version of the API. Um, I want to say that the goal for, for the next cycle will be to reach uh, at least to uh, the micro version 251, which is uh, train. I'm going to add a link to that as well. And uh, for that, we have been working with the NDSU students, which I think uh, they are on the call. Um, there are many, well, for the different microversions we have between Rocky and Train, uh, we have some changes that are uh, minor stuff and some others that are bigger that actually are, um, well, actual features by themselves. Uh, for those, we are going to be finding some uh, blueprints so we can track the work that we are going to be doing for those. Um, and well, for the bug fixes, we are just going to well continue with the usual bug fixing and review process. Um, but um, today, I want to make focus on the feature that the um, students have been working on, which is uh, adding the possibility to have multiple subnets per share network in the UI. Uh, each of them associated to different availability zones. Um, right now. Uh, they are currently working on mocking how this is going to look like. And well, the next step is going to be implementation of that. Um, it's still in early stages and we are hitting a lot of bugs um, in which, well, we are trying to, to address those slowly. Um, so I uh, just, you know, um, our request for you is that if you see changes going on for the Manila UI, please uh, help us review those and testing those. And uh, well, uh, that way we can move forward uh, with the upgrades as soon as possible. So um, 
I don't know um, if uh, students, um, let me see, maybe cameras go, uh, any of you want to share some of the work you have been doing on the mockups for uh, the networking and um, identity, sorry, um, yeah, well, identity management in, in the UI. Yeah, sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, should I just share my screen then? I suppose. Oh wait, no, never mind. I can't. Uh, I can help you out with that. Okay, could you please try now? Okay. So we, um, these are our wireframes. So this is a wireframe for the um, create share network panel where you would first supply a name and description for creating a share network and then supplying an availability zone if you want it to have one. Um, if you wanted it to be a null AZ or a null availability zone, you could just uh, not select one in the dropdown and then also a dialogue for adding subnets, so neutron nets and neutron subnets. Um, and basically just letting, updating this because before 2.51, um, this there's no option to add an availability zone to a share network in the create share network dialogue. So adding in that functionality from 2.51 and then um, allowing them uh, the user to as many subnets as they want to the share network that they're creating. Then we also have a subnet panel if. Uh, do you have the updated version? I just grabbed no. the one speaking doc. Okay. Um, this should be, should be an updated version. Uh, I don't know why. Wait, it might be this one. Nope. Huh. If you want, okay, if you want to grab, do you have the updated version? Because you can just replace, you can just send the link in the uh, meeting doc and then I'll load it up. And uh, right, it will be a minute uh, if Jonah wants to talk about his panel. Is this, is this one? Yeah, that's Jonah's. Okay. It'll be a minute for me. Is Jonah here? Oh, it looks like he's not in here. Uh, uh, I'll be talking about- I uh, unmuted. I forgot to unmute myself, sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so yeah. my This is also not up to date for mine, but it's fine because the only real thing I added or changed was that I made the update security services and create security services just lead to the same thing on the wireframe. They obviously be coded differently, but for the sake of like design wise, there's no real reason for them to be different. Besides that, yeah, it's just listing security services. There's, there will be a thing you can see on the right side, there's the processing thing that will just display ever after the user does anything to kind of just show them like, hey, the button that was registered, something is happening. And then it's just going to be a command line prompt that will show all the code running. Besides that, yeah, it's got adding security services, details of each of them. Yeah. And then when, Sh when uh, Shko is getting the, uh, his wireframe. I found it. Uh, I sent it. Is that Can you send it in the meeting doc? Oh, meeting doc? Then... I, it's not in the meeting doc, but I can put it in the meeting doc. Yeah, no, can you just like link it? Yep, yep. Is 
Does that work? Yep. Go ahead. Okay, so for this one, um, as you can tell from the other version, the uh, one that was not updated, there was no drop down boxes for your containers, so it wasn't as fluid. This one, I wanted to make it more fluid. So as soon as a subnet gets into the pool of tables, you can hover over that subnet and it will basically showcase you a drop down menu that you can then delete your subnet or update it as you would like. And you can also see information based off of that subnet. And then there's another drop down menu box that will then take you to a container within the same panel. So not, it's all fluid. It will basically let you add a subnet to the existing shared network. And it will also contain a text box to search for a subnet information based off of your needs and then an exit button if you would like to exit out of that container. So I just made this to make it more fluid. And then we're also um, currently working on just updating the share networks table to display just the name description because um, before it's uh, these columns here. the columns it currently has these new join net, new join subnet, IP version, etc. Um, no longer should be displayed in this table. So we're just only gonna have name description here and then move all that other information plus some extra 2.51 um, information into network details. So that's what we're working on now. We had um, some heavy setbacks earlier this week with uh, uh the dev server kind of just breaking on all of our development environments so we've been working through that but this is what we're currently focused on but yeah that's what we have all right guys it's looking very good thank you so much for showcasing um that they were friends to the rest of the community uh, please, um, if we have operators uh, watching this and you are frequent users of the Manila UI and this uh, is the stuff that uh, you care about, please submit feedback so we can include that on the review process and we can uh, make sure that the UI is uh, well functional and also usable as, as you expect for your everyday work. Um, I don't know if there is any comment or question or anything you want to add uh, today. This is great. Uh, thank you, folks, for bringing this here. Uh, but I, is the I think the only part that I didn't uh, hear about was the launchpad stuff and the Tiger thing. So we are like leaping forward with the versions here from 2.46 to 2.51 in this case. Um, but there is going to be some uh, unimplemented uh, gaps here. That's a good point, Gotham. Yes, we didn't talk about the Tiger War, and I think we should, so we can uh, see um, at least well some some breakdown of the different tasks that we have for the each micro version update. Um, let me see. Um, I don't know, uh, Carlos. Uh, do I have permission to share my screen? If so, I can I can try to share the Tiger War, or if you can do that, that would be awesome. Yeah, I can give uh, your permissions. Uh, yeah. Could you please try and see if, it, if it's going to work? All right, let me fin find the link first for the Taiga and I'm going to share my screen now.
Okay, so let me see if I do actually have access to it uh, here. And we have the Kanban view. Okay, so um, okay, so we have the cars in here. We need to add the different tasks. Um, this was initially created by Carlos, and uh, the idea is to start uh, drafting which are the different um, uh, features we need in order to reach for each of those. Um, I actually have this is something I have to do, um, and uh, haven't filled that yet, but. Um, the breakdown I can share in the document we were discussing with uh, the students. Um, basically, oversees uh, two big features we need to implement, one related to replicas, um, which actually, well, we find out there was a kind of bug in there uh, that we need to go over it. And the other one, I cannot remember right now, but let me check quickly on this document we have with the students. Okay, so directly sharing the notes from here. Uh, this hopefully is going to look better on the Taiga. Um, so uh, this is the share replicas one I was mentioning. Uh, at first, I, I was not very sure about uh, the panel for share replicas available in the UI. This is something that is available, but the thing is that um, we need to um, have share types that actually allow replication. Um, this is something that is not documented and it's not working as expected for us in the UI, so that's something we need to fix in order to reach to 2.47. Um, uh, I don't know if you... Oh. I think you were mute for some for a bit of time, Victor. I kind of lost the audio for a little bit. Check, check. Did we lose both video and audio from Victoria? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I can see her unmute or so. Yeah, me too, but no voice yet. Okay. But yeah, uh, so you were saying on the chat that you could add folks to the Tiger Road, um, Tiger Board. Yes, exactly. So well, we created this board, but if you do want to join the board, uh, please let me know your email and then I can add you to the board. Uh, the adding people process is manual, so I can work on that and I can add you to the board. So yeah, uh, please let me know your email and then I can add you. Yeah, I like the use of Taiga again, um, it, but yeah, we're not deviating from the community uh, community's official tracker which is launchpad yeah. uh, i guess the reason we're doing this is because there's just 
way too many small things that we want to keep track of. And, um, you know, there is a tracker on Launchpad, um, but it doesn't nearly give you the flexibility to add some of those things that we're looking to track with these Tiger cards. Uh, so there is no, you know, hard and fast rule that you have to join Tiger and stuff. So if you want to ignore Tiger, uh, that's fine. Uh, I think one of us can still, uh, you know, move the trackers and take any notes over there that that we want to take. Um, and this is only relevant while we have this huge micro version uh, gap between the UI and the uh, and the server. At some point, we want uh, we we're going to see this project wrap up. Yeah, query. Yeah, and it can be. Oh, I, I think I heard you, Victor, now when you on mute. Can you, yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I'm so sorry about that. I just um, don't know what happens with my audio on Zoom. <laughs> they just don't play along. Um, okay, so I hear you talking about Taiga using us a tracker. And well, that it basically is for us to organize our work. And um, yeah, the only thing I missed to mention it was about the other feature that we were discussing um, for one of the micro versions, um, which I don't know if you actually got it from me or if it got just right there. Which was that, which feature? So it was the one related to adding um, the manage and manage button as we have in shared panels, but uh, for shared servers. That's another big one we have, and that is for uh, getting to micro version 249. Yeah. So we will be filling a blueprint for that. Uh, it's, a, it's a big feature. So um, we will try to draft how should it look like and, and how should be implemented. Uh, but actually, we don't have any assignee working on this. Uh, we are going to push uh, either way to 251 as soon as possible, uh, since this is just adding a feature and it's not that it's um, going to break something. Uh, but yeah, that's a feature that's going to be pending in order to, to reach that parity that we are looking for. Yeah, uh, that's a big feature. That's for sure, and that uh, requires some designing. Uh, we can push uh, push for that too, but uh, I like the plan of uh, working on the 251 as well because it's it's another big one, and uh, we should also have that one uh, in the Manila UI. So yeah, uh, the ones uh, between uh, these major features they do not sound that big. So yeah, uh, if there is anyone interested in uh, working on those uh, features as well. Uh, please uh, do so and you are totally welcome. We can help you out with reviews and if you have questions, you can bring up to us. Uh, but yeah, uh, there is a deficit uh, from in, in the model API at the moment and we uh, kind of need like some features to be implemented in order to get the feature parity we want uh, between uh, clients. So yes, uh, that's, that's one, uh, one important thing about this. Cool, um, I can get back to screen sharing. All right. So yeah, uh, so we went over the uh, the Taiga board and uh, the like the work we, we still need to do. And yeah, there are a few items here and that's got to mention and I mentioned too, if you would like to be added to this Taiga board, please do so. But I mean, uh, it's uh, not, completely necessary and uh, we will also be tracking this with the blueprints and so on. Cool. All right, uh, there is, I see there's another question here as well, which is to, uh, which is about how to show share types during share creation. Uh, we need users to be able to see 10 visible features when picking share types. Yes, uh, this is a good question. And it's something that would uh, be an enhancement of usability, I think, because I mean, it's uh, as a user, it would be nice to uh, not only see the share type name while you're choosing it, but also to see uh, what are some uh, features that, uh, like the, the features that can be shown 
and you would see uh, them before the share creation. Uh, yeah, uh, any thoughts on that? Uh, I would like to, to uh, start discussion now. Yeah, I think, I mean, there's the, the whole point of the tenant visible extra specs. Before this, I guess we just had uh, the driver handle share servers was always visible, but it doesn't really matter to the end to the UI because we we, uh, we had that be true or false. And if it was true, we would show the share network dialogue. Uh, sorry, the drop down. If it was not, we would just not show it. So it was kind of obvious, even if it was not uh, visible. But now we have conflated the tenant visible extra specs to almost every optional feature there is. Right, so technically, can you take snapshots? The user does not really know, um, and unless the share type is named so, or something like snapshotable shares or something like that, um, they won't really know what they're picking. Um, so I think definitely putting it somewhere in the create share dialog makes sense. Uh, and the other thing I guess is I don't know if we we we've ever built a panel for share types for end users if they want to like look at the other details about share types like what is the description the operator is given what's the other extra specs um, maybe look at all the extra specs at once in some place and stuff without having to resort to the, using the cli that would be that would be really good i think um, but at least looking at these optional but important features like can i snapshot this share after i've created it can i clone those snapshots can i revert snapshot etc those sort of optional features seeing that you can even do them uh, based on the share type on the shared create dialogue would be super helpful yes i agree uh, we could we could take a look in the uh, shares dialogue but one of the approaches that i think would be uh, and, and there is something that's already used for uh, other projects is, for example, uh, like when you are uh, launching an instance, for example, you will start by like writing the instance name and saying if it's going to be booted by a volume and so on. And then at the left side, there are some tabs. So uh, we could uh, adapt our case. So we could have like another tab for shared types. And then when you pick the shared type, maybe uh, like a box is like a field with the information of that chart type. I think this could be one of the approaches we could use for this, but uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, it, it would... Yeah, I like that. We, you're just saying, so we, we call out that you want these features and we give you like some sort of a thing and then we filter the share types based on that. Yeah, that, that works too, exactly. That, that works. And uh, also like the on, there is the, the another simple way to just uh, you can uh, pick the share type like have a drop down with all of the share types available and then when you choose one uh, it's going to show like the properties of it like uh, below for example so yeah um, these two are, are, are two approaches i think that uh, would follow the same standard that we are using for the other uh, projects too because like a flow that uh, it's kind of uh, similar uh, in the uh, instance creation for example but yeah, we would have one of that for chart types. And I think we wouldn't like be uh, filling the screen with like lots of information. It, it wouldn't get confusing. Yeah. Yep. So I can open a, a, a blueprint for this and we can like bike shed a little bit more on what, what design to follow. Yeah, sounds great. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, all right, folks, uh, do you like to add uh, more thoughts on this discussion on the Manila UI updates? Uh, or uh, I think we are covered here. Yeah, I think so too. Thank you, guys. Yep, thanks, everybody. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, thank you uh, for joining us. Uh, thank you, Victoria, for bringing this up. And thank you to the NDSU students uh, for uh, for picking up this issue and uh, for sharing their progress with us and sharing their ideas on the things that they want to, to get done. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just want to offer welcome the NDSU students to the community. And uh, I hope to see you at the
Thanks to Gigi as well. <laughs> uh, Ashley, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Can you hear me better? Yeah. Sorry, my mic is also giving issues with the Zoom. I just wanted to welcome the MDSU students to uh, the community and uh, that we hope to continue to see you some more during the weekly meetings and the PTG. So. Yeah, we'll do. Thank you. Appreciate it. And yeah, we kind of we kind of had some pretty major setbacks uh, during the week when we were trying to code our uh, projects. Um, for our dev servers just would not cooperate with us, so we apologize for that. Nope, it's just the dev stack tax that you pay when you're just starting with <laughs> yeah. OpenStack. So you're it's part good. of the process. Uh, yeah. 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 That's cool. Yeah, we should we should catch up some more next week and um, and you know start working on some of this stuff. This is cool. We'll do. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, thank you, folks. Thank you uh, for this uh, this discussion. And yeah, uh, I think uh, we are kind of on time uh, for the next discussion. Uh, yeah, would you like like a four minutes of break so we can be uh, here on the schedule time for that? Or uh, you are okay with uh, proceeding? Actually, let's get a break, like a four minutes break. <laughs> it's, it's short, but we can at least stretch. So yeah, and then we, we are going to get back. Okay, so four minutes break, we will be back soon. Right, so uh, consistent and secure airbag changes, uh, Gotham, Vida, and Liron, uh, floor is yours. Yep, thanks, Carlos. So Liron's not able to attend uh, today, but there are some notes here on the Etherpad, and I want us to start by taking a look at the uh, specification that, um, uh, that's been put together. Uh, it is a governance goal. So, uh, the links on the chat. If you can pull that up, Carlos. Thank you. All right. Uh, I, th I think we're joined here by, uh, by Gansham. Uh, so it, uh, thanks for joining Gansham. Uh, and a lot of folks uh, put a lot of work to kind of round up all of the stuff that was supposed to be done with this goal. Um, so I, I'm just going to give you like a, a brief overview before we get into what, what it is that we're planning to do for the Z cycle. Uh, so as you are aware, uh, during the Wallaby cycle, we, we kind of refreshed the default API are back across the spectrum uh, for all of the uh, Manila APIs. And we put in some amount of testing at the time, uh, but we, we kind of wanted to follow up after uh, with more protection tests and stuff. <laughs> And uh, more importantly, in the last um, uh, in the last PTG, a lot of uh, things moved, uh, and, and that resulted in this uh, governance doc uh, with a, a, a more solid plan of trying to get all of the OpenStack projects to a consistent and uh, and uh, uh, secure default for all of the APIs and resources that these projects are managing and stuff. And you will see some of the motivations over here. I couldn't have worded, it, worded this better. Um, so as to why this uh, is important uh, across the stack uh, and you know, what are the motivations with, with the personas that are, that are currently uh, exposed via Keystone and uh, why you know, services have to uh, kind of support these personas by default. Um, so de definitely, that's 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 good good reading for you if you're an operator or a developer that's trying to add any APIs to uh, OpenStack, right? And so uh, where we are today, section I can uh, quickly go over. Uh, so uh, in Manila, uh, we we did, we moved policy into code uh, alongside all of the OpenStack projects. Um, we have, and it's been so for a long time now. I think it was Okata, uh, if I recall right, and we. Have, the, I mean, the keystone roles um, 
and and scopes was something new that was introduced uh, pretty recently and then we um, uh, we adopted uh, support for the scope uh, uh, you know uh, parameter in the wallaby cycle and while we did that uh, we also went through and refreshed the defaults uh, default are back across the a uh, apis to make sure that the scope uh, is considered and when we, when we were doing that uh, default RBAC change, uh, the the default RBAC is the is the one that's uh, supported. But if uh, I mean, but it's not enabled by default. Um, it, it's kind of confusing. Yes, we've been in this state for a few cycles now, um, and the, the the whole reason was that it was a, a pretty humongous change, and we wanted operator buy-in before we went ahead and def and and switched the defaults. Um, you know, uh, and stuff. So you you will see that the default RBAC looks uh, may look different from what is actually deployed in the cloud. Um, but uh, the the uh, I mean, what is actually being working in the cloud? That's that's probably because the cloud does not probably currently use scopes and stuff, and that's all right because by default, um, even if the default RBAC says that you know system scoped. Uh, you know, operator uh, system scoped administrator versus system scoped reader has the default access to this RBAC rule. There is a fallback RBAC rule, which was uh, which which was there prior to that change. So that's the state uh, of things today. Uh, and in the community, um, there is a policy pop up team uh, that that uh, kind of you know addresses concerns cross community, and that is responsible for uh, coming up with this whole governance talk and the uh, and you know the documentation that that's there in the keystone service as well as um you know a plan for how how to go about and making sure this is consistently implemented across the projects um there's a little bit of a direction change um and somewhat significant for us for having completed this uh, uh initial uh, you know switch over uh, and I, I I I like it that Kanshams here because I'm not I, I, you know I I was still reading through other um, you know discussions that are happening elsewhere. Um, part part of the thing that we ought to change though is the fact that um, I, we didn't assume that a system administrator was what the system administrators changed into after this document came into place. Um, so a system administrator uh, has no project scope. Of any sort, uh, so a system scoped uh, person with an admin role uh, is not going to present a project ID when they uh, when they operate on Manila APIs. So this is this is pretty uh, huge for us because we don't want to be able to create resources, or uh, in a, in a in a sense, uh, allow manipulating resources every time we we uh, we want uh, we, uh, the resources associated with a project. Uh, and I, and I like to interpret this in a in a, in a further way that if you're consuming the cloud in any way, such as we are the the consumption is billable, right? You're trying to create uh, a share or create a share replica, create a share group, etc. Um, you should always be operating within a project so that the billing uh, aspect of it or the consumption is tied to the project. Um, and so uh, that is something that we did not uh, we we didn't have in the in the uh, first iteration of this um so that's the direction change as far as uh, i can see kansham is there anything else uh, uh, uh no i think you have described it really well but uh, the <clears throat> the main direction change is to isolate the system scope uh, token and the project scope token to operate on their uh, system as and the project level resources respectively mm -hmm. So uh, the <clears throat> uh, yeah, so th that's the one, and uh, we have the very detailed uh, like this document as Gautam mentioned. So if anyone have any question, you can reach out to uh, TC or uh, the pop up uh, team, or like uh, because we have the now this has a community wide goal, so pop up team uh, we can might come we might complete, but uh, I'll be around uh, to answer answer the things. So only uh, the only thing like uh, uh, what I, when I have uh, attended other project sessions, especially Keystone, Heat, Nova, and all, uh, then I can give you the brief or Cinder. I can give you the brief what challenge uh, uh, we are facing in those services as per the new new direction. 
and if that is related to Manila, then I think that will be good, good to note down now. And on Thursday TC session, we are going to discuss all those. So challenge in that is uh, many of our APIs are mixed with the system level information in the project level resources. For example, Cinder get volume. So get volume return the host where volume is present. And host information is system level information and get volume is project level thing, right? So project, when any project token uh, do the get volume, they should not see the host information there. And system token cannot do the get volume. So how they will see the host information. So these kind of challenges are there. So from Manila perspective, if you have such API where system and project level things are mixed up, I think that's the one uh, very first thing we need to uh, figure out, uh, and then we can discuss how we can uh, how we can fix those. So uh, this community wide goal is divided into different phases. Uh, yoga uh, cycle was uh, targeting phase one, and uh, Z cycle also phase one at least. And then phase two is about service role and manage, manage, mm, I think manager role. That is still to be done in Keystone. So we are a little bit uh, late on those. So, but in Jet Cycle, uh, our assumption is if all the services implement the phase one, then it will be a, a good, uh, good progress in terms of the open stack uh, as overall. That makes sense. Uh, so, it, how does this? Um, how does Nova solve this get get server case right now? So, Nova thing was different. So, Nova, what how we solved in Nova the use case was we create the server on a specific mm -hmm. host. So, this that host can be requested by the user project admin. So, there what we uh, and host uh, API list host API list hypervisor that API was only accessible to the system. So what we made to compromise in this is, we allowed project admin to list the hypervisor, but that will only return the UUID of the hypervisors. And that UUID they can request in the create server request, and then we can boot that server on that specific host UUID. And why it is not security leak is, because we return host UID to the project admin. So they don't know about any host name or any infrastructure information they can get to know. It's just a UID. So uh, they have the less information about that. So that is how we, we are going to solve that. That spec is uh, uh, there, like I need to implement in Jetcycle. But in Cinder, the, uh, the problem is different. There is no list host. Uh, information that system can get. So it's just the host information is embedded in the volume response in the single yeah, HIV. So, so it's quite complicated. And other uh, mix up uh, uh, thing is, which might not be applicable in Manila, but it's in the heat. Uh, you might have seen the mailing list. So heat uh, create stack, that is a single API, but internally they call the multiple APIs, for example, NOAA flavor create, NOAA server create. NOAA flavor create is a system level APIs. NOAA server create is a project level APIs. So that is also another open question uh, we have and we are going to discuss in TC. So if those kind of things are also there for Manila, I think that's uh, something we, we need to figure out first before we switch the flag and, and uh, make operator like their no, life totally. difficult and other yeah. thing is uh, on switching flag what we discussed in noah noah is uh, pretty much like very much ready in the yoga cycle but switching the flag because noah do interact with other services like cinder neutron and like uh, you have the manila integration project uh, patch also so manila also might have that right so if those services which noah is interacting are not ready with those new RBAC, whether 
our operator can consume NOAA with new RPAC enabled by default or not. So for that, uh, we decided first we will migrate all the Tempest NOAA test to the new RBAC. And then we'll get more clear picture whether things are working with the NOAA having scope enabled by default and Cinder Neutron having the legacy policy. So that kind of combination, we'll be testing that. And then we will think about whether we can switch it, uh, this flag to be enabled by default. So uh, the, yeah. those are the uh, two main thing like uh, uh, we need to figure out uh, on every services. Yeah, makes sense. And and I was not in the room with the get volume stuff, but I can confirm mm. we have a similar stuff even in uh, ah, okay. one another. So it's pretty much like looking at this uh, server, uh, except I didn't know the UUID, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, approach that Nova has. Um, yeah. So it, it, is it not uh, a, a possibility that only creates are disallowed by the system administrator, but, uh, you know, retrievals are fine? Is, is that not uh, a possibility? Yeah, that uh, we can see, I think at the end, if there's no possibility, then we have to allow like system reader admin to get volume and there you could return the host information and if a project admin is doing the get volume you don't return the host they don't see the there. host information so that's the exactly. one solution but let's see how how we we discuss and figure out that okay i mean awesome. that that's a, a compromise we have to do because as per this new rbac goal our main goal was to completely isolate system and project scope right but because our openstack apis are so much tied with each other it's difficult to achieve this uh, isolation at 100 percent level somewhere we have to do some compromise exactly either that or provide an alternate api that alternate uh, yeah alternate api was a little uh, costly yeah, but, yeah for long term yeah it was uh, like a uh, very good term like in noah we discussed whether we can create a whether we can allow a server uh, whether you can allow a system to create a server for any other project but that require a new api uh, where they can require pass the project id in that but that doesn't seem like a, a good solution because it yeah. uh, api change and existing user has to change mm -hmm. the api it's, it's exactly. this is not good yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Okay. Yeah, so if, so if any other specific thing you have, I'll I'll be uh, here to answer that. But I'll let you guys to discuss Manila Manila thing, and I can answer if you have anything. Uh, Absolutely. To answer. Yeah. Thanks, Kansham. So um, yeah. So per this document, it, it this it's spelled out pretty uh, this thing well. What what needs to be uh, the community's goal for the yoga cycle and for the uh, Z cycle. Um, so we are in the, uh, I mean, look, if you look at the Z cycle, the, the goal is to complete phase one of this, uh, of, of this multi-phased approach and it's spelled, spelled out all the way to the C cycle. Um, that's, that's going to come up. So it's, it's a multi-release effort, uh, mainly to make sure that the transition out of this phase is as feasible to an, uh, to an operator as possible, um, so that's the uh, gist of it. I think um, I don't really have anything uh, specific to call out. Yes, I think the one thing is when will the enforced scope be set to true? And Kansham answered that part. Um, it is it is challenging. I think uh, in terms of finding out what what works when when we set that to true and and whatnot. So we are following up with the testing of this uh, alongside the code changes. So Vida uh, added the, the the QA plan. Vida, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, actually, um, I got them. I got them. Um, so I pasted the um, the Etherpad, the QA discussions. Um, we covered a whole, basically, a lot of the um, cases that were talked over there, and um, I also pasted that bug. Um, above in line 135, which was one of the issues that they discussed and they reported. So um, if anybody would like to learn more, please refer to this etherpad.
Okay, so yeah, for Z, then uh, we just need to ensure that phase one is completed and then uh, in the next cycle, we need to be looking into the next phases, right? Yeah, precisely. And we might get some early work done in case there are any, I mean, so Keystone uh, needs to expose um, two more things for phase two. Uh, so I'm not sure uh, we, can, we can get much yeah. progress done. And and we'll we'll see like how things goes in Keystone side. If they are delayed, then we can swap the phase three to phase two. Phase three is system reader reader kind of things, but that require scope to be enabled by default. So we'll see how how things progress. But uh, completing the phase one in Z cycle uh, will be really a good progress, and we will get to know like how many things are broken and how many things we need to solve. Uh, the things, but uh, I really like the plan for this testing thing. So if, uh, uh, even though you are not enabling the scope by default, but if you can migrate all your Manila test case towards the new policies and say, for example, one job at the starting to make the enforce scope to true. And then if everything is working fine, then migrate every jobs to make run on the enforce scope to true, which is nothing but in dash stack you can enable Manila enforce scope to true by default, which is what NOAA plan is, which is I'm going to do it uh, after the PTC. So that way you will get to know uh, when Manila is running with enforce scope as a default in dev stack, all the installation things are okay and all the testing things are okay or not. So that doing it in a parallel in G cycle, Z cycle will be like a, a very uh, bonus point to know how many things are working and how many things we need to fix it. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Gansham. Yeah, that's the that's the plan. And, and yeah, and the bug uh, that uh, uh, this one, uh, 1964509, that is a very valid bug. I'm, uh, I started it to fixing with existing test case and all, but I could not complete it to PTZ, but definitely I'll uh, work on this uh, as a priority. And if you need any any help from Tempest or DevStack side to provide more credential or anything, and just uh, ping us uh, anytime and we'll take these as a as a priority priority work. Sure thing. And I'm not sure if uh, we kind of, uh, I don't think we've commented. So we're currently using a workaround here, which is to enable admin and uh, reader so that the admin can create the reader. That's, uh, that's kind of yeah. what's happening. Yeah, I didn't realize uh, it like the same project ID hierarchy and all uh, until Michael uh, uh, reported that. But yeah, yep. that will be a good thing to test uh, all the negative possibility whether reader is able to do the admin thing or not. Yeah, totally. Yeah, but uh, as you mentioned in early earlier, like doing more and more testing, whether it's unit test, functional test, or integration test. Uh, it will give us a more confidence uh, whether this RBAC thing are consumable by the operator or not. Awesome. All right, that's that's all I had uh, for this. And so there's gonna be more uh, follow-up, uh, like Kansham said, at the TC room and elsewhere uh, for this. And uh, if there are any concerns, we'll bring it up at the weekly meetings. And uh, oh, yeah, one other thing we wanted to call out is, uh, I mean, we we definitely need help. I, uh, you know, at least there's there's a ton of tests to write, protection tests that we try to call them. Um, and Leron's gotten started on the patch. You saw that in the collab review last last release. Um, so we need, you know, such tests written against every single API. It's quite a laborious task um, for a single person to go to go through or for two people to go through. Uh, so we're looking for help. So if you're looking, if you have some bandwidth and you have, you, you could offer help, uh, Leron and Vida, the people to get in touch with um, or talk to me and I, I'll, I'll put you in touch with them. Awesome. Yeah. We do have that change here. I can link the review change. And if folks want to take a look there too and uh, add some suggestions too, I think it's it's a good thing. And uh, Gotham, I think the other uh, part of it was um, most of the tests that we have now are um, API centric. So like Kansham said, um, to harden this uh, and uh, test it 
thoroughly, uh, we uh, should consider adding like unit and functional tests, which, um, you know, it'll be very helpful to have folks contribute there. Yep, totally. Enhance our coverage. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Cool. Uh, any more thoughts uh, on this? Okay, uh, I'll take that as a no. So uh, yeah, I think that concludes our discussion here. Thank you, uh, Gotham Vida, and also Lidon for the efforts. And thank you, Ganshan, for uh, joining us uh, in the session so we could uh, talk about the our back changes. Yeah, I think it's uh, this sums it up our day for PTG then. Uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, the recording will be made available in the next few hours in the OpenStack Middle channel. So yeah, if you missed a part of the discussion and, or something, please go ahead there and, uh, and watch the recording and uh, go to the part you would like to see again.